Hi, everybody. Hi, I'm Chris Leith, and welcome to today's show. Um, this is The Economy and You, if you haven't watched our show before. Uh, the Economy and You, we talk about all sorts of weird and wonderful things that are going on in Hawaii. We talk about um, entrepreneurship, we talk about technology, and we also talk about politics. And so today's guest is Michelle Tippin, who's with the Libertarian Party. Hey. Welcome to Think Tech. Thank you for Thank having me. Thank you for being me. on the nice show, to see you. Michelle. And um, so we're um, so you're running as a libertarian, and libertarians, of course, haven't had a big, a big voice in Hawaii right. politics. Right. Right. Okay. And uh, of course, the Republican Party hasn't offered up a lot of nominees this year or candidates this year. So. Yes. And I did notice in the filings that there's quite a few libertarians. Mm -hmm. So now, if you're a libertarian, what, how do you sort of differentiate yourself between Democrats, Republicans, and then we have independents, and then we have libertarians? Right. Um, well, a common joke is that uh, libertarians are actually Democrats, Democrats who have opened a business, mm -hmm. or Republicans who have started smoking weed. So, um, <laughs> basically, <laughs> so basically, what you're looking for when you when you find a libertarian is um, someone who believes that the government should be. For me, it's sword versus shield, the law versus law as a sword or the law as a shield. So the law should be here to protect us, mm -hmm. not to implement um, ideals upon us or, or types of like restrictions upon our lives. You mean like the um, nanny state concept? Yes. Yes, like uh, Hawaii. The, the paternalization yes. of government, yes. <laughs> so like things, in, and not to say that I don't think that these things are good or bad, because mm -hmm. things like helmet laws, you know, right. of course, of course they make us safer and of course that's important. But, but wherein is our free will and our freedom of choice that we're guaranteed in our country? Um, and then what measures should we take just to demonstrate, like, okay, well, if you don't want to wear a helmet, right. we aren't going to offer, you know, care past X. You know, like, we're not going to offer... Because that's generally the excuse you get with the government when you talk about things like that, is they're regulating it because the government's expense associated with taking care of that mm -hmm. justifies their involvement in it. So, so you're saying things like with, with, when you talk about a helmet law, for example, that what you're saying is okay, fine. If you if you crash your helmet, you crash, and, and you're, you're not wearing, wearing a helmet, helmet. we're not going to we're not going to revive you right. if you die on the scene. Right. It basically, like a do not resuscitate, where you have you've you've stopped breathing, you've stopped your heart, your heart has stopped beating, mm -hmm. um, you're dead on arrival essentially. Uh -huh. And if you're not wearing a helmet, you've basically demonstrated as an adult who can make that decision that you're making it. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. To so where in other words, there's a Rather than saying, look, you can choose to do it this way, but there, there is a consequence right. attached to it, rather than writing you a ticket every time right. that you're, you're, you're caught driving without a, or riding around without a helmet and, on. And allow people to make their own decision. People are smart enough to make their own decision if you give them the information. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think that we need to legislate decision-making to people. So taking that element out of politics, I so think, is So you mean important. like legislating oversized sodas? <laughs> right, yeah, right. Like, like in New York, you know, yeah. making sure that, and and of course, you have this fine line where it's like, where where do youth come in as opposed to adults, and when do you find that youth are making their own decisions? And of course, you should not have soda in school. Of course, it's yeah. a learning institution, and sugary drinks don't contribute to a en learning environment. Mm -hmm. And um, beyond the fact that it's unhealthy, <laughs> you know, but if you give a child a soda and they're running on sugar their brains don't perform as well. So there are justifiable reasons why it's not should be offered there, but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean a parent can't send their child with soda. It just means you're not gonna make it easy for a child to obtain that outside of their parents' consent, really. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, legislating consequence for behavior, not legislating behavior, I think is really an important thing. And we don't believe in the militarization of, like, we don't believe in military force as far as like accomplishing goals. We feel that people can come together in a consortium, if you will. You know, we should be able to talk about things. We don't need to force people to do things. You see? Now, with libertarians, you're, you, 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 you advocate for smaller government. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Um, and less, less of a nanny government where... Reduction of spending yes, and things yes, like that, yeah. Okay. Um, and libertarians have a position on defense issues is that the, there should be a smaller, a strong military or a smaller military or... It should be a fortified military that's non-aggressive. A non-aggressive military. So Do you see what I mean? Only works for the defense of our right. Why, why should we be imposing our ideals on other countries when we are not them? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's very Romanian. You know, it's very Caesar to 
just say, you're going to gonna do it. what I'm going to say, and yes, then yes. that's not, that's not. But we're a nation that projects power. That's what right, we do. We project right. power all over the world. And we can project power without being aggressive mm -hmm. to other people. You know, we, we don't have to take away other people's things. We don't have to be the bully. Uh -huh. <laughs> we can just be the teacher, if you will. We can, we can be a mentor, but we don't need to control. So what about shipping lanes? Like, we, we, we basically make sure that shipping lanes, like bad actors like Iran, don't block shipping lanes or, or do things. And we generally and do nasty. that for our own best interest. Well, we do that we? for our own best interest, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, they bene they're benefactors of that because oil couldn't move through the, right. the ports of Hormuz and places like that. So that base that bases it itself, I guess, on the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you want to be very strict about libertarian philosophy, then the companies whom are transporting the oil need to protect it. But what you would have from that would be a cascading effect into price, yeah. and you wouldn't want that to impact the people beyond what we could tax and regulate ourselves. So having an opportunity for the people mm -hmm. within our own government to say, okay, we acknowledge as the people of Hawaii that these shipping lanes need to be made open from, mm -hmm. let's say, Alaska or let's say from even Australia, because we do have restrictions on our shipping as a Hawaii port. Yes, we do. Which has Through a substantial the, the effect Act, on our... Right, yeah. which impacts our economy every day. Substantially. Yes. I talked to the grassroots... Um, I don't want to get off subject, I'm so sorry, but the <laughs> grassroots... The people at Grassroots um, Institute, Institute mm -hmm. told me that... Um, and I believe them because I, I know what shipping can cost. It's approximately 30% of our cost of living is accounted for in the increase of shipping over mainland. And coming from the mainland, I did see it um, a few years ago when I got oh, yeah. here. Yeah. So, um, so for sure. And... When it comes to regulating and protecting those those shipping lanes, it would be something where you look at what the people desire, because above and beyond all else, legislation is supposed to be representative and reflective of the people. You know, and this goes to one of the things, you know, what I, and I have to say, I really appreciate the fact that you're running for office. Oh, thank you. I really, really do. <laughs> I'm because, glad somebody's happy about yes, it. Yes, I am. And, it's and, good. You know, and I think a lot of people, you know, what, you know, Hawaii is known as a very apathetic state when mm -hmm. it comes to people voting, and shame yeah. on all of you out there who don't vote. Uh, because here's the thing. When you run for office, you're making a sacrifice. Your yeah. time, your effort, your, your, your money, um, the money of other people who believe in you. Yeah. And the thing is, is you're making that sacrifice. And for people to say, my vote doesn't count. But what, you're really do, what they're really doing is they're taking away from your sacrifice. When people don't vote and they don't choose somebody to represent them, because there are people, there are lots of people out there whose voice you represent mm -hmm. that would align themselves with you. Right. And the, 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 the great thing is, is that you, they now have a chance to have somebody with, with has similar ideals right. and beliefs and philosophy about way, the way things should operate here. Mm -hmm. And if they don't vote, if they don't vote for you or, or another candidate that represents their interest, what they're doing is they're diminishing your sacrifice. That's the way I look at it. Because uh, you know, they're making this effort. I, I truthfully feel like if you fail to vote, you've, you've really blindfolded and, and gagged yourself. You, mm -hmm. you truthfully, um, we are pushing for a none of the above option. Um, and in other states that exercise the none of the above option, if you don't like any of the candidates, mm -hmm. you can vote none of the above. And if none of the above wins, all candidates have to be replaced. They cannot run again. All candidates have to be replaced with new candidates, and they hold a special election to allow the people another opportunity to find somebody suitable. I'm going to change my name I to none of the that. above. That's yes. going to be my new name. <laughs> There's somewhere that you can get it. But, you know, I, I really do advocate for people absentee voting, yes. spe specifically because it's really easy. They mail your ballot to you a month ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Um, I advocate for people to watch YouTube and actually look up their candidates yeah. and see who you're voting for. Don't just look at the, the letter next to their name because that's not always indicative of how they're going to behave in, in Congress. You want to see how they talk. You mean there are people who are conservatives and with a D under you'd their name? You'd have never guessed. You'd have never no guessed. No way. Not never in guessed. Hawaii. Really? Never, never, <laughs> never, never, never. never. Um, but yeah, so um, la in 2014, that was how I voted with, yes. with the, <laughs> the bong in my lap. Yay, libertarians. Um, so I actually... I smoked a little weed and I watched through um, several debates and uh -huh. I made a decision based on what I felt was the quality of character of the people that were on the ballot. And um, so really, 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 there's a, there's a movement called No Vote, No Grumble right. here in Hawaii. And that's really important for people to keep in mind is that when you silence yourself, you cannot expect mm -hmm. to be heard. And the thing is, you know, they don't realize it, but what they're actually do is doing is they're diminishing the sacrifice that you're making because they're basically saying your sacrifice isn't 
worthy of them taking the My time to vote. My sacrifice is for them. Yeah, and, so, and for them not to vote really diminishes, diminishes Well, it keeps your, me from being able to voice what they, I, if, right, I, don't, if I don't know what, oh, I'm so sorry, if I don't know what your beliefs are, if I don't know mm -hmm. what you want from me, mm -hmm. I can't be that voice. Right. And I, I don't know, I, diminishing is such a hard word for me to like think because for me the sacrifice is, is without, I do this for me. Yes. I, I, I believe that we, human race, not yes. just Americans or Hawaiians, we can be so great and we can really just make this planet the best, like, but we, we squander, yes. you know, and we ignore problems when they're little and then wonder why they get big. That's right. You know, and here's the thing about voting. Voting is a sign of appreciation. I think it's a sign of desire. I think yes. you, have to, you have to demonstrate where your beliefs are uh -huh. or they'll never be heard. I, I truthfully, I know, I know many people who don't vote because they don't like what they feel are the two options they have, which is not really true. You have many, there's way a lot of people on the ballot, you guys. Um, but people say, well, the South Park approach. What was it, a giant douche and a turd sandwich. I love South Park for that. Okay. They talk about one of the characters on it, his name is Stan, and he refuses to vote because he thinks that both options are poor. Yes. Instead of making his voice heard. And that's why we do like that none of the above option, because you have to be able to be heard even if the choices you have are unsuitable for what you want. So mm -hmm. allowing people to say, you know what, my voice is, I don't like none of this. Um, is, and I know that's really terrible grammar, I'm sorry you guys. <laughs> but you know, making sure that people understand and can see that there's differences. You know, we watch like the presidential election coverage in November, yes. and you see the, the red and the blue and the red and the blue and the red and the blue, and people think those are the only two options, mm -hmm. um, which is unfortunate, and it's changing. And um, so now people really need to embrace this, this variety that they have. You know, it's like going to the first time, going to like Jelly Belly Jelly Beans and being like, oh, there's 300 different That's flavors. A, I love that. That's such you a know? analogy. Yes. And, and there really is that. This year, I think there's nearly 20 presidential candidates running. I was, I heard on the radio a cat was actually registered as one of the candidates. I don't know if they're going to let that through, but they, <laughs> they weren't able to find a, an injunction or a rule that prevented that at the time. Uh -huh. So even as much as a, a cat. Yeah. So wow. really, we do have a lot of options, maybe even more than we should. Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break, okay. and we're going to come right back. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about other, some of the more local issues like rail, okay. uh, transparency in government, and some other things like that. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm Chris Leatham. This is The Economy and You. Today's guest is Michelle Tippins, and we'll be right back. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, and one of our delights is to be partnered with Think Tech Hawaii and produce programs every week. Every Monday at 2 o'clock, we have a show called Ehana Kako, which means let's work together. So we bring people from all across the nation and the country, and certainly throughout the islands together here to talk with them about how to work together, and how to work together to do the following, to build a better economy, a better government, a better society. So if you're interested in the research of our think tank, the Gr Grassroot Institute, or if you're interested in how that's applied at the governmental and community and business levels, you'll enjoy the fascinating conversations with our guests on Ehana Kako every week on Think Tech Hawaii at 2 o'clock on Mondays. Until our next show, I'll see you. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> And we're back. Hi, I'm Chris Lee for this is Economy, The Economy and You uh, here on Think Tech Hawaii. And today's guest is Michelle Tippins. She is a libertarian candidate for the House of Representatives in District 24, which is now the, the incumbent is... Uh, uh, Delabalati. Delabalati. Del Albalati, yeah. Al Albalati, that's yes. right. I, I think it's all of it together. Yeah. I think the owl is required. I don't think okay. it's a middle name. I think it's actually, it's like McDowell. Oh, okay. You know, like Albalati, I think. Now, no, but what was your inspiration to run for, for, for office? What was the thing that sort of sparked your, okay, I'm going to do this? Well, uh, your epiphany, I guess. Okay, well. so when I got here in 2013, mm -hmm. uh, I kind of hit the ground running. I was an activist for uh, medical marijuana and patient rights in Texas, which is a little bit more of a, of a monster than it is here because you do have a, a 
more friendly environment. Uh, I was in a Republican environment, so it wasn't quite as friendly. But um, I came here and I started to find all these like chinks in the army, if you will, cracks in the system. And when I started approaching the legislators about it, and I lived in a couple different districts over the last couple years, so uh, it's been different, um, mm -hmm. different representatives and different senators, and I was finding a lot of um, finger pointing and a lot of apathy as far as like, well, and oh, and there wasn't a lot of movement. And I says, well, you know, I, I really, I want to be the change that I want to see. And so the change that I wanted to see was that laws were going to start going through a little bit more quickly, and we're going to be read. I mean, oh my goodness, some of these laws, there's, it, I, you see in the newspaper where it's like, oh, this is in there, and then you ask a legislator about it, and they didn't know. Mm -hmm. But they voted for it, yeah, because things are getting amended in between um, committee meetings and oh, they're not discussed. It's, it's a it's a sausage factory. Yeah, I and mean, <laughs> I I spent twelve years at the legislature. A, yeah, yeah. So yeah. so I really wanted to see um, some changes like that, and I wanted to see a little bit more of um, com not strictly common sense, but science influenced um, legislation. Because what I've seen a lot of over the past couple of years has been fear driven. Um, and uh, very opinion driven rather yes. than looking at the data right. and understanding the, the, the consequence of the way things are and mm -hmm. how we can improve them by actually taking the time to look at the data mm -hmm. and, and the science of something rather than just, well, this is my opinion on something and that's, right. so that's why I'm going to vote on it. Yes. Right. And, yeah, and yeah. unfortunately, um, science changes and evolves constantly with new information. Mm -hmm. And when you have um, a group of people who's ability to be right is very important to them, which is politicians, I think. Um, you, they, they, they need to be right because they represent us and thereby they need to represent us in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. And so it's very difficult, I think, um, for a politician to maybe say, you know what, I'm, <laughs> I'm so sorry, you guys. I've been wrong for a little while and I need to fix that now. Well, yeah, because there's that, 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 that need to be consistent, right? But mm -hmm. consistency for the sake of consistency, Consistency, it's I think, kind of is, a, is a is sort of a, a, a fool's errand. Right, I know? agree with you. Um, I think it's important that when people are given new information, they'd be and, and the public needs to allow them to change mm -hmm. their mind and not say, "Oh, you're a flip flop." Right. Well, and and one of the like, <laughs> it's not just about flip flop. You know, like mm -hmm. understand, but people need to be willing to put out, say, "Hey, look, I know I said this last year. In the past year, I've had this new information come forward to me." It's available to you all on my website, and this is why I'm changing my opinion on this. And mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with That's doing right. that. And, and circumstances change as mm -hmm. well. Right. You know, where something may have been the right thing to do in a certain context, mm -hmm. that context may have changed over time. Mm -hmm. Well, know, and, and yeah. just having legislation that's not necessarily put in the, like, when you move forward with legislation with the best of intention, mm -hmm. you're probably going to end up in a bad place. I know that we found that lesson with the Super Ferry, making legislation that was specifically tailored to ease through certain types of Mm -hmm. parts of that super ferry project right. and then it came back and bit us in the butt and we lost millions as a state and not only that it hurt our reputation and as a as now we're, we have a reputation as being very business unfriendly mm -hmm. to foreign or outside investors because yes because of something yes. simple that just didn't need to happen we could have waited three months mm -hmm. you know it could have taken a few more months time and done it right so you know that's again not not looking at the facts, not looking at the fallout, not looking at the repercussion, but actually just being like, well, yeah, we need to make that happen quick. Let's just do it. Yeah. And you know, it bites you in the butt when you don't do it right. Mm. So, so yeah, I, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. So now, what are your thoughts on on now? Um, let's talk a little bit about transparency in government because okay, obviously, government. you know, transparency in I our government. Because we talked about this a little yes, earlier, right? So it. we talk about transparency in government. You know, we don't necessarily. We don't have a transparent court system. Right. You, there are a lot of times when the courts are supposed to be open, but if you go in there and you're not a party to mm -hmm. to the litigation, the judge will throw you out. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm dealing with a custody battle with my ex-husband, mm -hmm. and um, I brought some people with me to court who wanted to testify as to my character. Yes. Like the character reference type, and they weren't allowed in the courtroom at all. Right. They they were told that they had to wait outside. Yes. So not even. You know, despite wanting to testify for me, we're even denied entry. So. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, um, when you don't have transparency in facets of government, then the court uh, and the, the, the system, the bureaucracy, gets to engage in things that are less, <laughs> yes, less than honorable <laughs> behavior without that accountability. Right, you know, right. Uh, and, um, and, and it encourages that kind of behavior, I think. 
So we definitely, yeah. I see the value of the transparency. Yeah, I think, I think transparency is really vital, especially because the people here want to be involved is what I see a lot through like news and through the newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, people care about what's happening. Um, and if you don't, you should. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yes. You should, especially in islands. Like, the mainland, I can make excuses for people. If you don't like it, you can move a few hours away, right. you know, something like that. But on an island where we're looking at, oh my gosh, sustainability is like one of the most important things I can possibly even address. But understanding that you're in a small little landmass, mm -hmm. and that small little landmass has to make room for all of us. And we have to start really understanding what we're doing with ourselves and with each other and, mm -hmm. you know, how we're impacting everything. And then with the transparency, making sure that that transparency is applied so that our legislators are acting in a way that's for the best of the people and not just for the best of, let's say, a campaign fund. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't, I don't, that's not an accusation because I don't keep track of anybody's campaign <laughs> fund, but my, barely my own. I got, uh, uh. I have one campaign contribution so far, <laughs> so I've done really well keeping track of it. But, um, you know, when you focus on where your money's coming from, instead of voicing for the people, you'll start to lose that integrity. Yeah. And, um, and I think integrity has got to be one of the most important things when you're legislating rules that we all live under. Well, it's a, it's, it's a, little, bit, it's a little bit challenging, too, because there's certain, if you're in a particular party, there are certain expectations that you're going to have a certain sort of lean mm -hmm. on, on particular issues. So right. I, for example, I'm very much an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. I think the environment and taking care of the environment is a key issue. Yeah. Now, that really applies, probably applies to sort of Republicans here. Mm -hmm. Maybe on the mainland, not quite as much. You know, yeah. Kind of, yeah. But we are yeah. sort of on unique. Mm -hmm. Our own Republicans are a little bit different than I think yeah. than the ones on the mainland. They are, um, but we also get accused of being rhinos if we don't take halter conservative issues, you know, right. position on issues, mm -hmm. which um, I think there needs to be sort of space, uh, some latitude to operate within the parties, you know, yeah. and, and that allows for multiple ways to approach a problem. Right. Well, and and you should always have. Well, number one, I think that people should represent the party that they believe in. Mm -hmm. Number one. So, like for me. When I moved here, I thought I was a liberal Republican, and I immediately fell upon all the Republicans in the island, uh -oh. and uh, one of them's a very good <laughs> friend of mine. You probably know him. Um, uh -huh. And uh, I actually rented a room from one of the, like, the main Republicans that does a lot of um, religious freedom lobbying and stuff yes. at, at the Capitol, and he's a wonderful, wonderful man. And um, I stumbled across him, and they says, well... You, you have a tattoo. You have a lot of tattoos to be a Republican. And where I'm from, everybody's Republican and everybody has tattoos. So uh -huh. it's, not, it's not quite the same thing. And so, yeah, it's a completely different expectation and animal. But I think if you, if you really take the time to find out which party is aligned best with what you believe, mm -hmm. you really, it's very difficult to go wrong, you know, it, because that's where you are. That's where your heart is in the first place. Mm -hmm. And... Um, when I went to the Libertarian Party um, convention in November this past year, I was really happy because there was a lot of discussion. You know, there wasn't a lot of arguing. There was a lot of discussion. And I like seeing that because I think it's really important that people embrace the idea that democracy is not about doing it perfectly right the first time. It's about having a body of law that can evolve with us, and it evolves with our knowledge, not just our opinions. And so having a body of law that can actually evolve with the new information that we're talking about a minute ago, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. learning the science to stuff and taking and changing measures. And I, I feel like we got off topic. I'm so sorry. No, no, it's great. I think that's, that's <laughs> I feel it's, it's like, saying, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, like embracing the idea that we have an evolving body of law that can be amended. We saw this with the dispensary bill. It took 15 years to get a dispensary bill through because it, they did start lobbying for it in oh, 2001. Right? Yeah, wow. I've, I've spoken to people oh, who have wow. been trying it's this been long. It's been that long. Wow, that's um, amazing. The medical marijuana program started in 2000. Uh -huh. So a really long time trying to get the, uh, the dispensary bill passed, mm -hmm. and it was because they wanted it perfect. And perfection but, but, is But even, even okay, you say it's perfect, but there, were, there are a lot of they didn't get it people. Perfect. I don't, they just yeah, wanted to. I think they're all <laughs> from perfect. But I, I think the thing is, is now we, we've got, we've set up, We've decided that we're going to have eight dispensaries. Is that yes. island-wide or is that statewide? That's statewide. That's statewide. That's statewide. Okay. Um, and it's actually, it's eight dispensary licenses, and then each license is authorized two locations and two grow locations. Okay. So there's, there's, there's going to be, it's allotted per island. Um, I believe Oahu has three. 
Big Island has two, Maui has two, and Kauai has one. So now are people going to be right. vying to have the, yeah. the growing location in their backyard? Or is that, um, how's the, that there's work? a lot of regulations surrounding that. Growing locations are going to have to be indoors, um, and that's because there was a lot of concern about just weed running rampant, which... Well, I think it already does. It, it does. I think the um, weed already does grow here naturally. There, there are well over yeah. 14,000 registered medical patients here on the islands, uh -huh. and each one of those patients has a, the right to grow their own. So there's actually legally allowed to be 14,000 medical marijuana grows in the in the state of Hawaii <laughs> currently. So, Is that right? Wow, so that's So over that many, yes. Yeah, so wow. currently, so that, that, that fear is unreasonable just because you can't really get out of that now. We already have many thousands of people growing their own medical marijuana, and they've had to for 15 years because they didn't have an option. Um, so uh -huh. the dispensaries are really kind of great for everybody if you really want to think about it that way. Okay, great. That's great. Um, <laughs> we're going to take another commercial so break. Sorry. And then I want to I pick on the rail a little bit. You okay, want to pick on the rail? Can we we'll pick, pick, on, on, pick the on the rail? Okay, I'm Chris Leith, and this is The Economy and You. We're going to pick on the rail. We'll be right back. Aloha, my name is Reg Baker and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Business in Hawaii is a program that is positive stories about business in Hawaii. Uh, we're tired of hearing the negativity and why it's the wrong place to have a business. We talk about the positive reasons for having a business in Hawaii and, and how to be successful. We broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Justine Espiritu, and I am the co-host of Hawaii Farmers Series. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson, and we are live with you every Thursday at 4 p.m. at fintechhawaii.com. And our show focuses on Hawaii's local food uh, community. We feature not only the farmers that are producing our food, but we also feature the supporters and other folks involved in the community that are trying to promote local agriculture. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to The Economy You. I'm Chris Leatham, and today's guest is Michelle Tippins. We are talking about uh, her candidacy as a libertarian um, for House District 24. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit, we're going to pick on rail a little bit. Okay. Okay, so um, now I look at the rail as um, it's something that we sort of uh, created that's very controversial. It took a long mm -hmm. time to get it passed. We're now committed to building it. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, how do we make it something that isn't just a white elephant? Right. Right. Um, well, <laughs> it's very frustrating for me because when I look at the rail, I, I come from places where they've used rail very successfully. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most beautiful things about rail over the bus is that it's on time every time. And that's beautiful. That, that, <laughs> that is, is just so antithetical beautiful. to er the way that's things so work beautiful. in Hawaii, though. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but I, I come from, uh, from uh. Dallas where they run a rail. Um, the rail comes, trains are like every 20 minutes. So mm -hmm. they're, they're pretty steady come and they, um, they've, they've done a pretty good job at making sure that they stay on time. Um, but coming from a place where I like the rail and I believe <coughs> in the rail, uh -huh. I also feel that we've executed the rail kind of poorly. Um, we talked about this earlier uh -huh. uh, today, as a matter of fact, about how creating a rail that is paid for and used by tourists Yes. makes a rail that's sustainable into itself. And a rail that maybe would have started in town and gone from town to maybe Waikiki or town to the airport first to facilitate tourist movement mm -hmm. um, and then continued on. So let's say we start at the, in town, we build the station in town, and then so from what's, there... What, when, you, and you, when you talk about town, you're talking about moving from in Honolulu. Honolulu. In Honolulu. Like build, okay. For example, where the um, Alapai Transit Center already is, okay, and there's already plenty of parking, and there's already the bus main transit center there. So, like yeah. in Dallas, we we integrated the rail system with the main bus transit centers. So okay. the rail comes in, and then all the buses are right there for people to go out and go from there. So we start with the transit center at Alapai, and we build our rail station there, and then we build a rail station in the airport, and that way. Tourists can now get from the airport right, right, right. to Honolulu that and then grab buses. Very, every taxi driver in town upset with you 
because they, they depend on that revenue. But people who take taxis are going to continue to take taxis. People okay. who take the bus and pay, take the rail are going to take the bus and the rail. I didn't take a bus until um, 2010, I think. Uh -huh. I was in Cancun, and to take a to take a taxi was going to be like eighty-five dollars, and to take the bus was three dollars and fifty cents. And I was, you know, what? the cheapskate in me won that <laughs> argument so quickly. Um, heavy bags or not, so. Uh -huh. um, but people who want the convenience of a taxi or are, are going to use it. They are. Period. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that was the fear. I think that was right. the fear, you know. So. And, and again, yeah. looking at fear-driven, fear-driven legislation. Yes, yes it's yeah. a fear. Well, we yeah. have millions of people come to this island every month. Mm -hmm. Millions every month. It's more than enough people to satisfy all the demand for the taxi industry to have clients. Mm -hmm. um, so we start it right there. We start with the rail from the airport to town, to Honolulu. And then the bus system is able to supplement them down on the 2 and the 2L. Uh -huh. And then you just have to add a few lines for the 2 and the 2L. Just throw a couple extra buses on. And then that starts that they're getting people to Waikiki already. Mm -hmm. It eases traffic near the airport on H1. And it eases the dangerous traffic, which is that confused tourist traffic. You know, this one where they're like, oh, God, where it's kind of how I drive well, you know, sometimes. All the, all the one-way streets. <laughs> I mean, one of the problems, of course, is that we have a lot of one-way streets. And mm -hmm. if you're a tourist, you're trying to get around in, in Honolulu, really and you don't know how the one-way streets work, system yeah. works, you're just, you're just driving around in the yeah. You're looking for Without something. You can't find it because you can't get there from here. And, and now mm -hmm. they've taken away our ability they, the ubiquitous they, uh -huh. um, has actually constrained us from using mobile electronic devices in our car, period. So you used to be able to use Garmin, no more, no more. That's now considered illegal. So if you put your hand on your GPS, you're, you can, you're susceptible to a ticket. Yeah. Um, and most people are not going to purchase a TomTom Tom or a Garmin at $400 plus dollars when they've purchased an $800 iPhone to which their GPS should work. Yes. So taking away people's ability to utilize that GPS is going to further cause problems with the, the lost tourist driving. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's throughout the island. That's not just a Waikiki problem. Because well, what we need to do is we need to pass a new law that says every <laughs> rental car needs to have a mount for your phone mm -hmm. and so you can just mount your your phone see there's another nanny law. We but can see what now. I mean like it's just more and more and more and more when we could actually look at what we're doing mm -hmm. and say, all right, let's evaluate the signage system and look at the signs that we have on H1 and make sure that they're clear. There's a specific one I can think of right off the top of my head. It's at about mile marker six on H1 uh -huh. and it's got, it's just before all the construction, right before the H2 exit. And it's got the, the H2 and it says, you know, the exit only lane, but it doesn't say how far the exit is. And it's two miles before the exit, this sign. Oh my God. So my, f I've, and the reason I know it's a problem is because it's gotten me a few times. Oh, oh I'm yeah, so sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I move over, you know, all of us do it. We all move over because we see the sign and we're like, crap, we got to move over. And you move over and then the next sign says a mile and a quarter away and there's two more exits between there, which is where people are going to be okay, merging. Okay, so they're moving over and then it's crazy. So, it's so yeah, just poor signage. You yeah. know, improving the signage would make a difference for traffic. Um, the rail obviously being done in a better manner. Mm -hmm. I, it, we're pot committed, in my poker terms. We're pot committed on this, on this project now and we're basically to a point where doing it the right way is almost out of reach. You know, we've, we've, we've done so much of it the wrong way from the end back when we yeah. should have started at the beginning out. Well, then, uh, when so, we talk about the rail, um, one of the things that um, we were talking about was that maybe we need to have more tourist attractions along the rail oh, route. Oh, yeah, I think that'd be a great um, You know, great there's idea. talk about putting in a, um, a racetrack, mm -hmm. uh, an Indy 500-style racetrack out in uh, Kalailoa area. Uh, and yeah. I th yeah. think that would be really cool because then we would attract people <laughs> who, and of course, it should be a multi-purpose facility, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we had events and activities going on out there, in that direction, mm -hmm. we would have our tourists just naturally start using the rail, or at least that would be the yeah, hope. Yeah, um, the hope. Yeah. yeah. I come from a place where we do, we love racing in Texas. We, I live near oh, a speedway. Love, oh, oh y'all love racing Let in me Texas. tell you something about <laughs> Texas right now. My grandma lives close enough to hear the engines rev <laughs> to a dragway. And people, I, I did not know that people know where she lives because of the dragway. They, Is that right? They, they love to race cars. <laughs> oh, yes. We like our gasoline down there in Texas. Uh -huh. um, that being said, um, the raceway is kind of going to, my first response is, where's the gambling law? If we're going to have a raceway, that's usually what comes along with that is gambling. 
And in a state that's so conservative when it comes to victimless crime, I mm -hmm. think we would have to handle the gambling first and make that something that's permissible at some level, like maybe a lottery. Um, or maybe, you know, and there's all ways to do that. Well, now, how, does, how does that work now, with, like, uh, like down in Atlanta and, mm -hmm. and places like that where they have uh, racetracks and mm -hmm. so on? Is there legalized gambling in those places? Or how, it's, is it's there gambling like, that goes on with all that? Yeah, so, yeah. See, I'm just such a virgin. <laughs> I promise there's gambling. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I promise there's gambling. Yeah. I don't know if it's illicit gambling. <laughs> but there's definitely gambling. Um, you know... Texas, for example, there's no legal gambling, there but is there no is lottery, gambling. and oh, so oh, really? yes. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure that they allow people to bet on the races, but it's you know they. Well, see, it would seem to me that like what they do is they the run the, the running track. Holes. Yeah, yeah, I know. This, this, <laughs> that's one of those things, right? So, I mean, I know we had some laws that we we're going to talk about allowing gambling in Hawaii mm -hmm. for what we call electronic forms of gambling, like mm -hmm. website-based gambling. Which is uh, one of platforms. the least popular forms of gambling in the rest of the world. Like they were all these poker stars, like all kinds of lawsuits, and just mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't I don't know that people enjoy it as much as real life gambling. But. Well, yeah, I think it's <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, one of those things that um, where um, people are always looking for um, uh, some way to uh, engage in some kind of an activity mm -hmm. to sort of alleviate boredom or. Mm -hmm or to make something more interesting. You know, like for example, if you're racing on, now if you're racing, let's say you have a race car and you're, you're betting right. on your own race car, mm -hmm. right? I, I would think that people probably do that. That's sort mm -hmm. of a natural consequence of that. Uh, the question is, are they doing it, um, are they doing it uh, above board? You know, the thing about illicit gambling versus legal, illicit gambling is, or legal gambling is that, you know, there's some monitoring to make sure things are happening and right. legitimately and that's not uh, people doing things um, to undermine, or I, I guess to say, you know, they 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 contrive the odds mm -hmm. that are and, and such that uh, it's really not possible for people to win. Well, if you if you force anything that you force into the black market, okay. Mm -hmm. So the beauty about the white market, the open above table market, is that if you violate the expectations or the regulations of that market, the law, the government, the police will come in and they will act in the injured party's favor. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't have that protection in a black market. So what you end up having is you have people who, number one, want to protect their own self-interest. And now they must equip themselves and secure themselves personally, right? So now I have to buy a gun, right? That's that fear-driven thing again. I got to buy a gun. And so you got to get something like that. And you got to protect yourself. And now you got to protect your interests. And you got to demonstrate force. And you have to be scary. And you have to do all these things that if you simply made whatever it is that we're doing legal, mm -hmm. no need. Just the police. Because then you have structure. You have yes, structure you have structure, you have, regulation. Right. You have oversight with the police being able uh -huh. to make sure that, OK, he, Bob That's stole John's money. Yeah at the craps table and uh -huh. we have it on video and that video can now be admitted into a court if Bob doesn't return John's money. Mm -hmm. But when you ru run an illegal gambling operation, let's say, mm -hmm. and Bob steals John's money at the craps table, there's no winding the tapes back and calling mm -hmm. the police if you don't want to whatever. Well, and, and, it's shoot John. That's right. Well, and then of course in Hawaii we've always had uh, uh, cockfighting has been sort of <laughs> part of our culture here. And it's never been legal, so mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of one of those examples of illegal gambling. And you and you just you bring danger in inherently yeah. by by taking police out, you bring criminals in, and that's I think that's a really equation under really easy equation to understand is by yeah. removing the police from the equation, you actually allow criminals free reign. Yeah. So yeah, it's really important to keep things in the white market. Well, we're down to our last minute here, oh, so, I'm so sorry. I, uh, what I want to <laughs> so do sorry. is I, I want to let people reach out to you. How people how can people who are interested in supporting your campaign reach out to you? What's the best way for them to contact you? Ooh, um, right now, my phone, my, uh, actually, the best way to find me is either through Facebook on the uh, Hawaii Veterans Cannabis Alliance page, which is HVCA Oahu um, on Facebook. You can also find us on Instagram. You can find me personally, um, both by my name, and I also go on the moniker The Goddess M, which sounds obnoxious, but not really. It was my gamer tag on I Xbox when I started writing uh -huh. for the magazine. So that was my pen name, and it just kind of bled over. Well, but, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Christopher. <laughs> yeah, it was fun so to have you on the show, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just milking you dry. Yeah, yeah. Have thanks for being one. on Think Tech. And uh, so um, I'm Chris Letham. This is The Economy and You. And we'll be uh, back next week. So we'll see you then. Aloha.
Hi, everybody. I'm I.C. Davidson. Thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii. One of the things that we try to do here is promote civic engagement. How do we do that? We put on shows weekdays from 12 to 5 p.m. Um, we let people in, in our world on Facebook and all the social media. Today, I'd like to talk to you about another way that you can engage us here at Think Tech Hawaii and help us promote civic engagement here in Hawaii. Um, what you do is you get on Twitter. You follow us at ThinkTechHI. And during the day, between weekday, weekdays between 12 and 5 p.m., you can interact with each of our live shows. What does that mean? You can send us questions, comments, thoughts, experiences, anything. All you have to do is mention us on Twitter. We'll see it here in the studio, and our hosts and guests will address them accordingly. This is a, a big thing for us. We want to hear from you. The conversation doesn't start here when our show ends. It ends when everybody gets their say. Join us weekdays, 12 to 5 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. Join in the conversations live with Twitter, at ThinkTechHI. Thank you for watching. We appreciate your support. See you soon.